talking about the voter suppression laws moving throughout state houses across the country. Almost every state in America is dealing with a piece of legislation that would restrict access to the ballot box. Republicans are pushing these bills after a presidential election that saw record turnout and steps to make voting easier. One of the places that tried to make voting easier for people because of the pandemic, of course, was Houston, Texas. Last year, Harris County, which includes Houston, sent absentee ballot applications to voters. They offered drive-through voting, and they opened 24-hour early voting locations, and the result was historic voter turnout. Over 1.5 million people cast their ballots in Harris County last November, a record number. And despite spending tens of thousands of hours trying to find voter fraud, Texas Republicans found half, half as many cases this time around as they did in 2018. You want to know how many they found? Just 16 cases. 16. One, six, 16. None of them serious enough to result in jail time. So maybe it's getting better, more voters, and less fraud? But let's not forget the third big thing that happened in the election. Record turnout, steps to make it easier to vote, and President Joe Biden. For Republicans, this scene from Houston does not look like a step forward for democracy. For Republicans, it looks like your team losing the White House. That's why they fought so hard to stop drive-through voting last year. That's why they fought to throw out votes that were cast that way. And it's why tech, the Texas Senate has been working on a bill that would limit early voting hours, ban drive through voting, and make it illegal for local election officials to proactively send out applications to vote by mail. Top Texas companies like American Airlines and Dell have spoken out about the bill, as have Democratic lawmakers across the state of Texas, including the mayor of Houston, Sylvester Turner. And starting us off tonight is the Democratic mayor of Houston, Texas, Sylvester Turner. Mayor Turner, what are your concerns uh, about this bill? Obviously, we listed out a number of different things that are included, but what's most concerning to you? Well, uh, there are several things. It restricts uh, people's access to the polling booth. Uh, and number two, it is suppressive uh, in nature. And I, let me just say this. It, as you indicated, it restricts the number of even polling places uh, that you can have and the number of voting machines. It eliminates uh, a drive-through voting. It limits the number of drop boxes in Harris County, which is the third largest county in the United States. Uh, it requires people with disability to provide more inf information than they've had to in the past. And then it allows poll watchers, partisan poll watchers, to be inside of the polling place and actually video record people while they are voting if they think there is a reasonable suspicion that somebody is doing something wrong. Can you imagine how intimidating that will be to people who are actually voting? And can you imagine where these poll watchers will be doing this, primarily in people of color? And then what we have discovered is that for people, for the extended voting hours, early voting hours, 52 to 54 percent of those persons are people of color. So it works against people in general, restricts access, and it, and it's, it particularly targets people of color. You mentioned the fact that under the bill, poll workers will have the ability to record people without their consent if they, you know, think that they are doing something improper. Um, what kind of intimidation, you know, historically have you seen? Obviously, Texas um, is one of those states where there is a history of voter suppression and intimidation of voters of color. Um, so what do you expect will happen if this kind of provision is put into place? I think you're going to have a number of partisan poll watchers that are going to be stationed specifically at, uh, at polling locations uh, that are heavily um, let's say utilized by minorities, people of color, and they are going to be intimidating or attempting to intimidate voters. 
They're going to be in the voting booths. They're going to be video recording. And that's intimidating in and of itself. At the same time, you're going to have a number of these uh, uh, polling watchers uh, that are going to be in there. When can you imagine people who who speak don't speak English? Uh, people with uh, special disabilities who are, who need assistance while they are voting, and how intimidating that that will be. Um, and then when you come when you combine that with the fact that this bill, uh, Senate Bill Seven would limit the number of polling locations as well as limit the number of voting machines, then you're going to have extended lines. So when you when you put all of these things okay. together, not only do these bills restrict uh, the access to the voting, to the voting booth, but they are also suppressive and intimidating. That's why we say that these bills are no more than voter suppression with a specific target of people of color. Governor Greg Abbott is, you know, this is one of his big things. He's been pushing for this type of legislation. How is he justifying limiting the number of uh, voting machines or polling well, locations say, in these big counties, including yours? Well, they say that they are standardizing the process, uh, that allowing, for example, extended voting hours or voting, 24-hour voting or drive-through voting. Uh, were not included specifically within the statute. So they are standardizing the process because, and they are bringing about voter security and voter integrity because so many people are questioning the security of the voting process now. Now, let, let's just, let's just be, uh, speak specifically to that. As you indicated in your earlier comment, there is no, little or no evidence of any systematic widespread voter fraud or corruption or anything that's taken place. But it was almost 1.7 million people that voted in Harris County in the last election. Uh, little or no fraud at all. These were eligible voters. Whether you're voting uh, past 9 p.m. or whether you're voting in uh, some location that's open 24 hours, a drive-through voting, you had to be eligible in order to participate in this process. So this is a solution a solution looking for a problem when there is no problem. And then you have to bear in mind that regardless of what took place here in Harris County, that these there are hundreds of bills that are filed in almost 43 to 44 states across the country. So this is a systematic campaign intending to restrict people's right to vote, to intimidate people in while they are voting, and to suppress the vote. It is a systemic, system-wide, nationwide campaign, and you have to call it what it is. I don't care if they can tag it as voter security or integrity. I don't care how you tag it. Uh, I don't care how you try to dress this up. It is voter suppression, and it is specifically targeted towards uh, people of color. Exactly. Um, and uh, the point that people have been bringing up in terms of uh, the history of bills like this uh, and reactions from uh, Republicans after losses. Um, you know, voter suppression is one of the, the strategies that has been utilized previously, and, and that point has been brought out. Um, in terms of one of the debates happening um, in relation to this conversation is corpor corporate corporations and what they're deciding to do uh, in this moment. Obviously, you had uh, some companies, Georgia-based companies, speak out after the Georgia bill was signed into law after pressure from activists to say something and condemn the law. You have companies like American Airlines speaking out before your bill actually becomes the law in Texas. But do you think it could make any difference um, or is it too well, little too late? No, I'm hoping it can make a difference. And look, and I want to thank American Airlines for stepping up, uh, Dell Technologies for stepping up, United Airlines has stepped up and a number of other companies. Uh, and I encourage other companies to step up. And look, the, this is not a partisan fight. It shouldn't be. Uh, and that's why I want to thank uh, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, the NAACP, the Urban League, the National Association for the Blind, the Texas chapter. Uh, all of these, the League of Women Voters have all stood up. So corporations mm -hmm. have to get in the game, okay? And, 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 and it, it just kind of amazes me that you have Republicans who are saying to corporations, stay out of this. This is not your fight. 
But at the same time, they are going to these very same corporations through their PACs and asking them to write checks to their mm -hmm. campaigns. So you, you, can't have, you can't tell them to stay out of it. And at the same time, you want their money. Okay? It, 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 that's, that's a non sequitur. Right. It, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up. So corporations have to stand up. And let me no, tell it, you it doesn't add up. No, it mm -hmm. doesn't add up. And then you have who are the employees of these corporations? Who are their customers? Okay? Who's, who's buying their products? And, and democracy is the responsibility of all of us, individuals as well as businesses. And I'm reminded of what Martin Luther King said a long time ago. It's not the, the words of our enemies that we, that we will remember, but it's the silence of our friends that we will remember. And this is one time when the friends of democracy need to stand up and protect this democracy. In terms of some of the things you as the mayor of Houston can do, in Georgia, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, she signed an order directing city officials to create a plan to mitigate the impact of the, the law in Georgia. Could we see something like that from you in Houston, Texas? Absolutely. Uh, number one, we are hoping that these bills will not pass, that these bills will not reach the governor's desk. And, and we all need to do everything we can uh, to make sure, to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. And that's why we're encouraging people right now, all across the state, to contact your businesses, your chambers. I am so glad uh, the other day in the city of Houston, the Black Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber, uh, the LGBTQ Chamber, the Asian Chamber, the uh, Houston Area Urban League, all stood up and said no to these bills. And I appreciate that. But we, this is everybody's fight. And so to the extent, um, well, I'm not going to even assume that these bills will pass because they should not pass. And if we all are participating in this process and, and, and raising our voices, then they won't pass because voter suppression is not good business, okay? And voter suppression is not partisan. It's just downright wrong. And, and if uh, we stand up together, then these bills should not reach the governor's desk. It's important to always think about protecting the democracy as an American value and not a partisan one. Mayor Sylvester Turner, thank you so much for being here and for helping us understand what's been going on in Houston. It's been exactly three months and a day since a violent mob descended on the U.S. Capitol, threatening Democratic and Republican lawmakers, you remember. Oh, and they also threatened the vice president. In February, Democratic Congressman Benny Thompson sued Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and two extremist groups. Congressman Thompson alleged they incited a riot and tried to prevent members of Congress from carrying out their duties to certify the election. Today, Benny Thompson got some company. Ten Democratic members of Congress have now signed on to the Thompson lawsuit, which was filed by the NAACP. One of those Democrats, Tennessee Congressman Steve Cohen, saying, quote, as I sat in my office on January 6th with rioters roaming the hallways, I feared for my life and thought I was going to die. He was even considering which cemetery he wanted to be buried in. Another one of those lawmakers who joined this suit is Democratic Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey, my home state, and she joins me now. Congresswoman Coleman, why did you decide to join this lawsuit and why now? Well, because I think that, you know, there is a thread of what happened on the 6th with what happened before the 6th, what happened from the day after the election that stoked people up, uh, the conspiracy to get to Washington to try to stop us from uh, doing our job, but also by trying to stop us from doing our job, they were trying to disenfranchise after the fact the ma minority vote. Because you see the states that were being challenged, those were the states or those were the counties or the uh, voting precincts that had tremendous minority participation. So January the 6th was a manifestation of the stoking that took place with uh, the president and Giuliani and, you know, the, the Oath Keepers and, and those guys uh, stoking people up, planning to do something to disrupt it. But it was also an overt case of disrespecting 
the minority vote. And so that was preempt that that was post-election. And what they're doing now in the 40 states or so is is trying to prevent uh, African Americans in particular from voting in the future by making it more difficult, which is why I kind of led a letter to uh, Garland asking him, please look into these, because we think that these are an extension of the voter disenfranchisement and harassment I, I, that we saw back in the 60s. This is just an extension of white folks trying to stop black folks from voting. And I joined that. What do you uh, hope to, will lawsuit. be the outcome of? Oh yeah, I joined the I joined that lawsuit because I believe that, and because I believe that there needs to be accountability for what happened. Uh, that it was intentional, it was planned. That we need to know how far up and how inclusive the higher ups were in actually causing this uh, insurrection to take place. And then there needs to be, once there's accountability, there need to be consequences. Accountability and consequences. Um, certainly, uh, the FBI is, is trying to produce that result. Uh, what do you hope will, the outcome of the lawsuit um, will be? Obviously, uh, the insurrection, um, it feels like it was a long time ago, but it really wasn't. Um, and so in terms of the different paths to accountability, um, the lawsuit is one, but what do you what do you hope the outcome is? I hope that the outcome is that the consequences are severe enough. However, uh, they manifest in the in the civil in the civil uh, realm of justice that people will not engage in this behavior. They will think once, twice, three times that they will not be um, coerced into uh, mis uh, to, to believing misinformation and people who have evil intent like Donald Trump and Giuliani, uh, who continuously lied to people and stoked them up. I hope that what, it, what happens at the end of this, in conjunction with all of the other investigations that are taking place that may result in legal action, that may result, I'm sorry, in mm -hmm. um, criminal action, that this stops. And that there isn't this overt or um, implicit, explicit, preemptive, or, 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 or post-mortem on the suppression of the vote by minorities in this country. Because that's what all of this is about. We've seen it before. We've seen it resulting in the deaths of four little girls in an Alabama church. We've seen it in the death of three uh, voter registration individuals. We've seen it in Megar Evers. We've seen this before. So let us get on it right away. Don't wait for more to happen. Become preemptive on our part to make sure that there is accountability for this. Accountability is always important uh, after wrongdoing, and certainly after deaths uh, in this riot, uh, there should be accountability. So as we said, the FBI is going to hopefully ensure that. Um, in the aftermath of the insurrection, though, on the legislative side, there was a lot of talk about a 9-11 style commission um, to investigate what happened, but that's, that talk seemed to fizzle out. Has there been any progress at all? Is the lawsuit in, in place of that commission that didn't come to fruition? No, the lawsuit, the lawsuit from the NAACP lawsuit is uh, is different than what would happen with a 9-11 type commission. I think that the speaker still has that in mind. But perfectly honest with you, Zelina, there's so much stuff going on right now that requires our immediate attention that even what happened uh, just last this last weekend at, at the um, at the complex, at the Capitol complex, that we're really trying to grasp all of what's going on in real time here. That doesn't mean that there won't be a commission of some sort. Uh, we have to sort this out. We've got to work with our own uh, members of our own party. Um, unfortunately, this has turned into something that is partisan, but it's really about democracy and fairness. Mm -hmm. And it's really about um, eliminating hate and white supremacy. And we all should be there on, on, on that page. 
but it isn't. Um, you see what's going on with members of Congress right now from, from the other side. Uh, there, there's like so much going on right now that we are uh, chewing gum, walking and talking at the same time and still trying to keep up with everything we should be doing in real time. And pass the legislation necessary. Speaking of keeping up. Protect. Oh, yeah. Pardon? Absolutely. But speaking of, speaking of keeping up with everything you're, you're supposed to be doing, you were diagnosed with COVID after the Capitol riot. Um, how have you been feeling uh, over these past three months? I'm grateful. I had, you know, I had one shot and I had the monoclonal antibodies. So my symptoms were just were there for a while, but they were mild and mostly fatigue, but I'm feeling fine. And I feel really blessed that it was not any more serious than that. And my other two colleagues that were um, diagnosed right after the January 6th uh, insurrection, they also went through this. Their symptoms were different than mine, but we've all pulled through, thank God. That is very good news. Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, thank you so much for being here again, joining us, and please stay safe. Coming up, the race to get COVID vaccines out. We'll have a live report from Michigan, which is one of five states accounting for nearly half of the new COVID infections in the United States right now. We're back in 60 seconds. The race to get people vaccinated is urgent all across the country, but is especially urgent in a handful of states. New data from Johns Hopkins University shows that nearly half of new COVID cases are coming from just five states, New York, Michigan, Florida, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. The recent spike has been especially bad in the state of Michigan. New cases there are reaching levels that we haven't seen since the post-holiday surge. Data shows that it's actually younger people driving up cases and hospitalizations in the state of Michigan. The CDC says Michigan leads the nation in COVID hospitalizations among younger, unvaccinated people. That trend has Michigan health officials shifting their strategy to get as many people the shot as quickly as they possibly can. We were able to leverage some uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine to get to counties that were experiencing some of the highest um, case rate increases in the state um, so that they could uh, work, you know, to get that vaccine out to those who are under, under age 60. Um, so I think there are a lot of different techniques that we're using to um, get people vaccinated and uh, reduce transmission. Joining me now from Detroit is NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson. Priscilla, what are you hearing about this surge in Michigan and the vaccine rollout from the people in Detroit specifically? Well, Zerlina, we're hearing a lot about the numbers here in, uh, in Michigan, some of which uh, you just mentioned, but 40% of the outbreaks, the clusters that this state is seeing are coming from youth sports and schools. Right now, since February, daily case counts among children under 10 years old is up by 230%. And for children from ages 10 to 19, that number is 227%. So we're talking about pretty dramatic increase 
places. And of course, those children go home to families where uh, they often live with older adults. There are older folks in their communities. And so it is a concern. And it's why this week Michigan expanded their vaccine eligibility to include anyone over the age of 16. I'm here in Detroit and had an opportunity to speak with a mom who took her 16 year old son to be vaccinated. And she tells me that uh, her 16 year old has two younger siblings, one of whom has pre existing conditions. So it was very important that the parents got vaccinated. And as soon as her son, her eldest son was eligible, she brought him to get vaccinated as well. Take a listen to some of what she shared with me. The state right now is making this big push to get younger people vaccinated. What did you make of that when you first heard it and heard that your son would have an opportunity to get the vaccine? So I was very, very excited, um, only because I know the importance of it. And right now in our state, um, his age group is where we are having a lot of positive cases. So I knew as soon as I was going to get the opportunity and he was next in line, I was going to sign him up because he's active in sports and school and other things. And, you know, I just want him to be safe and I want others around him to be safe as well. And I do want to point out, Zerlina, that even as access to the vaccine expands, there is still a question around the issue of equitable access. Uh, and I'll give you an example here at Ford Field. This is a mass vaccination set, uh, site set up by the federal government in Detroit to reach the residents here. This is a city that is nearly 80 percent black, but only 9.5 percent of the vaccines distributed here have gone into the arms of black patients. So while the state is working and the city is working to vaccinate younger people. They are also working to shore up those racial disparities. Zerlina. Governor Gretchen Whitmer has said increased restrictions aren't the answer. Um, is the, the focus there in Michigan solely on vaccinating as many people as possible at this point? Have they given up on mask mandates and restrictions? So the governor did say that she doesn't want to put more restrictions on businesses, but she says that, yes, vaccinations are part of the solution. But the other important thing here is the mask wearing, is the continued use of those social uh, distancing and safety measures. And we've spoken to doctors and healthcare professionals here who have said that is part of the problem. People are letting their guards down. They're not wearing those masks as uh, diligently. Distancing has kind of fallen by the wayside in some situations, and that is why they're seeing these uh, rising numbers of hospitalizations and cases and the death trends uh, ticking up. And so there is this emphasis on continuing to get those folks vaccinated. Right now, almost 20 percent of the population here is vaccinated. But there's also that emphasis on people continuing to practice the safety measures until we reach herd immunity. Zerlina. Priscilla Thompson in Detroit, Michigan. Thank you for that excellent reporting and update on the status of things in the state of Michigan. Joining me now to unpack everything COVID is Dr. Uche Blackstock. She's the founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity. And we love her on this show because she helps us understand what's happening in this world around us during COVID. In terms of what you're seeing in Michigan, what concerns you most? When I hear something like youth sports may be the catalyst of, of surges in particular areas, I'm like, well, that seems like it was foreseeable why are people playing youth sports right now when it's clearly may not be the safest activity? Yeah, well, so thank you for having me, Zerlina. Um, I would say uh, youth sports as a cause for the spike, you know, I, would be something that would be unavoidable and, and something that should be paused immediately. I mean, the other issue is that we have the B117 variant out there in Michigan. Actually, all of the states that are seeing spikes uh, are seeing preponderance of that, that variant. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting that Governor Whitmer said that they weren't going to put more restrictions in place because we know that that variant is well controlled when restrictions are in place. And so we need those um, policies to be in place, but we also need individual citizens um, to keep up with their mask wearing and their uh, physical distancing. Um, I, I do want to say that I do think that we should prioritize keeping schools open. So if we need to close I know, businesses, um, indoor dining for a short while to get the case count under control, that should be a priority. That, that makes sense to me. I often thought that schools should have been sort of at the top of the list of figuring it out 
uh, safely before a bar. I mean, just my opinion. And I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> it just seemed uh, to make sense because people who work in restaurants have children. Um, and in these states, there's five states right now that are experiencing uh, half of all new COVID case, uh, COVID infections right now. Um, and I feel like from the beginning here, all the experts have been sort of predicting that there may be, you know, outbreaks regionally or in specific locations or in specific states, uh, sort of for the long term, um, as we, you know, vaccinate more people to reach that herd immunity number. Is this our future, our foreseeable future, just outbreaks? You know, you read news about an outbreak of COVID uh, in one state, um, you know, every month or so. So it may be until one, we reach herd immunity, which for a coronavirus seems like between 80 and 90 percent of the population uh, immune. But we also need to contain the cases. So it won't matter if we keep vaccinating, if cases um, keep spreading. We really need to do both. And I, and I think that everyone is just focused on vaccination right now. But we also need to also continue to practice those prevention measures that work. And I think until we do reach herd immunity, we are going to see these sporadic outbreaks for various reasons. Right now, we're seeing them because we have these variants and because restrictions have been uh, pulled back and folks are getting fatigued. And so we really want to ask people just to hold on a little bit longer, a few more months, uh, you know, follow those restrictive measures um, but, and also get vaccinated. Absolutely. Um, and especially because, you know, the, the, the measures the CDC is recommending, they're not that hard, right? A mask is not that hard to wear. It is not that hard to socially distance or be conscious around uh, about what other human beings you're sort of uh, going close to physically um, that are outside of your household. So I just want to do the thing where I go, OK, give a speech to the people who really wake up in the morning and they walk outside and they think the pandemic is over because there's a vaccine, maybe they've even had the vaccine and they behave as if this pandemic is over, please tell them why it's not. You know, what I would say is it's not over until we get as many people vaccinated as possible and until we get those case counts below. Unfortunately, until then, we're going to see a lot of unnecessarily unnecessary suffering and death if people are not following these prevention measures. There are still people out there, even if they're young with underlying medical problems, if they get infected, they are going to wind up in the intensive care unit. And we still have a significant number of elderly, actually, that still haven't been vaccinated. So we need to think about our community, not just ourselves, and, and realize that now is not the time to let up our guard. What's most concerning to you about the variants right now? I mean, obviously, the B117 variant is the one we talk about the most because that is the dominant variant in the states that are having these surges. But are there any of the other variants that you're paying very close attention to uh, that we should be also paying attention to here in the states? Yes, yeah, so there's concern. Obviously, the, the variant that was originally described in South Africa, the B1351 variant, um, there's concern that not only is it more transmissible or more infectious, but it could also be more deadly and possibly evade some of the vaccines. But these are mostly um, lab studies. And what has been shown so far, the vaccines that we have available, is that while they may be not as efficacious against this variant, they still are pretty robust and can be uh, protective. Um, there are some other variants, like there's, there's one that's also described here in New York recently um, that is still being studied, I believe was asked about the CDC press conference. But again, we need um, robust surveillance and, and studying of these variants to find out their properties, their characteristics, which ones are just of interest and which ones should we really be concerned about. It's really helpful to understand, and I'm paying very close attention to the variants as well, because uh, as we all know, viruses mutate, and, and this is an, not necessarily an inevitability, but it was definitely predictable by many doctors like yourself that this would eventually happen, uh, and we really needed to uh, make sure we were doing the mitigation and the vaccination, as you said. Dr. Uche Blackstock, thank you, as always, for being here and helping us understand this pandemic we are all living through still. Coming up, pardon me? Fresh reporting from the New York Times says Congressman Matt Gates 
asked the Trump White House for a blanket pardon, just as the DOJ was opening that sex trafficking investigation. What a coincidence. We're back in 60 seconds. Embattled Florida Congressman Matt Gates and former Florida tax collector Joel Greenberg have a very interesting relationship. It not only explains how Gates may have gotten involved in sex a sex trafficking inquiry, but also it may be the key to what happens next in the investigation. Greenberg is currently in federal custody. He's facing 33 charges, including stalking, identity theft, wire fraud, bribery, and sex trafficking of a minor. Greenberg has pleaded not, pleaded not guilty. But before that, he was best buddies with an increasingly influential congressman whose district was six hours away, which I have a lot of questions about that. That congressman, as you know now, is Matt Gates. Politico reports that mutual friends say that the tax collector looked up to the congressman and that Greenberg introduced Gates to a handful of young women he met on a, quote, seeking arrangement, a dating website known for connecting women to so-called sugar daddies. That's really what happened here. <laughs> Gates says he's never paid for sex. The two men also reportedly shared more than one girlfriend, according to Politico's interview with eight friends and associates who know them. Gates described Greenberg as a wingman and even promoted him as a potential congressional candidate. Greenberg's lawyer declined to comment to Politico for their report. Federal charges against Greenberg started to emerge last June. We don't know if Gates knew he would be tied up in some of the allegations, but according to the New York Times, months ago, the Trump loyalists tried to get one of the most valuable gifts a president can give, a pardon. The Times reports that according to two people, Told of the discussions, Gates privately asked the White House for blanket preemptive pardons for himself and his congressional allies for any crimes they may have committed. Trump ended up pardoning dozens of his allies, but Gates, sadly for him, didn't make the cut. In a statement released this morning, the former president said Gates never asked him for a pardon, and he definitely wanted to remind us that Gates was, quote, he has totally denied the accusations against him. But as the investigation continues, a lot is at stake for the congressman. And could his once wingman soon be a potential informant? Hmm. Joining me now to discuss is justice correspondent uh, for The Nation, Ali Mastal, and Mark Caputo, senior writer at Politico. Okay, Mark, I want to start with you. I am getting, I'm living off this story because it's just, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of tea in this story. So break this down very for poor, us. You wrote a political piece story. detailing yeah. this relationship between uh, Matt and Joel, the, the bromance. Um, who is Joel Greenberg? Like, what is a tax collector? What do they do? Who is this guy? Well, tax collectors in Florida are elected at the county level. We got 67 uh, different counties. And the, their job is just that, to get, jump, by and large, uh, collect 
property tax revenues that are used to fund local government uh, and schools. And it, they also have a smaller, lesser known function, which is to help issue state IDs. And this ties into the story. Uh, when someone comes in from out of state and wants a state ID, they can go to a tax collector's office. They can drop off uh, their out of state ID and, that, and then get a, a new Florida ID. That old state ID is supposed to be shredded. Now, according to the indictment, what Joel Greenberg was doing in some cases is taking people's IDs, accessing the state's driver's license information network and actually issuing an ID with his face and someone else's personal identification information. And he might have been doing this to have these sugar daddy relationships under a different name. And there are suggestions, the indictment's not very clear, that he may have actually done it for uh, issued a fake ID to the 17-year-old whom he allegedly had sex with and whom it appears that Gates is accused also of having a sex with. Now, Gates uh, firmly denies these allegations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's, uh, it's a big, wide-ranging investigation, and it's difficult to kind of get your, hand, your hands around because it's just so big. But the, their relationship started up at, you know, after 2016, both swept into office, him a congressman, and Joel Greenberg, a tax collector, uh, as these kind of modern MAGA, modern-day Republicans, a brash populist politics. They're into cryptocurrency. And as I wrote in my story, they, they were also into dating lots of young pretty women. But I don't understand how they even meet. I mean, do people meet that live 600 miles away from each other all the time? Or do they have mutual interests that would bring them together? And in this case, we're learning some of the facts surrounding their mutual interests. Right. Those are some of those mutual interests. Uh, they have a mutual friend uh, who was a former lawmaker named Chris Dorworth, uh, who lives in Seminole County, which is where Joel Greenberg is from. And also uh, Gates crisscrossed the state quite a bit. He had a very busy travel schedule. Orlando's right in the middle of the state, uh, and Gates would frequently be kind of dropping by and dropping through. And uh, according to our reporting, uh, a lot of the people who were mutual acquaintances, friends of theirs, said, look, you know, Joel had access to pretty women, and Matt Gates liked pretty women. But they, 17, you're, they're 17, uh, red flag. Uh, Ellie, I wanna play for you a clip from uh, Fox. Let's take a look at that and I'll get your reaction on the other side. President Trump should pardon Michael Flynn. He should pardon the Thanksgiving turkey. He should pardon everyone from himself to his administration officials to Joe Exotic if he has to. I think that the president ought to wield that pardon power effectively and robustly. So that was like, Pretty weird when he said it. I remember thinking it was weird at the time. Uh, just react to the idea that he went to the White House and was like, hey, Donald, can you give me a blanket pardon for any crimes I may have committed and all my friends? Um, just riff on that for a bit. Sounds like he's telling him on himself, right? Like it's like if my, my kids come down and say like, okay, you have to promise not to get mad. I'm kind of like, wait a minute. I don't want to promise that because it sounds like you did something you know you shouldn't have done. Um, yeah, the, the blanket pardon is is a is a real now tell. First of all, can I just say legally, I don't know what that means. Like, I don't, there, a, I, there's no, there, there's no uh, sense that a blanket pardon for crimes not yet even, you know, uh, alleged uh, would stand up in court. Um, so what he was at, it's kind of like when you are drawing to the second best hand in poker, like he, what he was asking for wasn't yeah. going to help him. Uh, but, but hey, the fact that he was asking for it certainly um, is, let's say, evidence of a guilty conscience. More than that, the fact that his buddy, an alleged wingman, um, is under federal indictment is also pretty compelling evidence that some that that he is in legal hot water. You know, this is not the Bill Barr DOJ. This is a real justice operation, and I would expect that this investigation will not be dropped as a favor um, to politically connected people. Um, his guy, Joel Greenberg. You know, one of the things that, that I've been saying that I think people really need to understand: the only reason why Donald Trump is not in jail is that his boys did all the weight for him, for him, right? All right, Paul Manafort came out here like WeeBay mm -hmm. and just took all the weight and kept his mouth shut until he got his pardon, right? So did Roger Stone, so did Michael Flynn. Now, Matt Gates cannot offer Joel Greenberg a pardon. 
nor can he have any real hope that Joel Greenberg will keep his mouth shut for his bromance, uh, uh, Matt Gates. So if there is something that Joel Greenberg knows that the federal prosecutors would like to know and are willing to deal with him, uh, Matt Gates could be in significant legal jeopardy. I know that people sometimes act like statutory rape isn't a real crime, but it is. Paying for women to travel across yeah. state lines, for sorry, for girls to travel across state lines to have sex with you is in fact a crime. And if he did that, and Joel Greenberg knows he did that, Meckitts could be in a lot of trouble. I mean, it seems like it, Mark, right? I mean, I think that uh, I, I always want to, I love a good wire reference. So I just want to note that that was an excellent reference to the, the amazing show, The Wire on HBO. I was also thinking about another reference this week, which is the, we fight on a lie. Um, uh, it, related to the big lie that Republicans are selling about the election. But Mark, in your story, you talk about this, this possibility that prosecutors could use Greenberg against Gates as an informant. Um, tell us more about what, what the threat of that is and, and whether or not he could really give them some of the goods. Well, a few things. One, you know, it's been about a week since the New York Times first reported that Gates was under investigation. Uh, everyone agrees that that's true. So far, we haven't seen any names of accusers uh, because there's also a prostitution aspect of this, that's, which might not involve a 17-year-old. We haven't seen anyone kind of come out of the woodwork and say, yeah, this guy harassed me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we haven't really seen anything in, in, in the solid evidence category. Now, there's time. Uh, as for Greenberg, one of the problems that the prosecutors could have is this is a guy facing a wide-ranging 33-count indictment. The first indictment that he faced was for making up a lie about a political opponent being a pedophile. And if you're gonna have that guy then testify against someone else and claim that he was having sex with a minor and not have persuasive evidence, I'm not sure that's gonna stick. There's time, there's usually about a five year statute of limitations mm. on this. So we're gonna see. Well, we will see. One of the things we learned from Donald Trump is that sometimes even on people who are potentially unreliable uh, in, in terms of uh, their testimony as witnesses can come with documents. Uh, and uh, that can prove uh, very important in these types, types of cases. Ellie Mustel, Mark Caputo, thank you so much for joining us tonight, as always. And please stay safe. It's day eight in the Derek Chauvin trial. And today featured the most extensive cross-examination so far. The prosecution began by recalling LAPD sergeant and use of force expert J Jody Steiger. She refuted claims but that bystanders on the street presented a threat. When you reviewed the body-worn cameras, did you see anybody throw any rocks or bottles? No, I did not. Did you see anyone attack, physically attack the officers? No, I did not. Did you hear uh, foul language or name calling? There was some name calling, yes, but uh, and some foul language, but that was about the most of it. Did that factor into your analysis? Uh, no. Why not? Because I did not perceive them as being a threat. Then the defense worked to discredit prosecution claims that George Floyd wasn't resisting. When Mr. Floyd was initially saying that he couldn't breathe, he was actively resisting arrest. Initially, when he was in the backseat of the vehicle, yes. Right. And in fact, he was using his legs to push back and to use his body weight to, uh, against the officers, right? Yes. And at one point, three Minneapolis police officers were attempting to get him into the backseat of the squad car from the passenger side of the car, correct? Correct. And they were not able to do so. No. The defense also played new body camera footage for both Steiger and a second witness who's on the team that investigates use of force incidents. They're again arguing that a knee didn't kill George Floyd. I'd like you to see if you can tell me what Mr. Floyd says in this instance. You hear what he said? Uh, no, I couldn't make it out. Does it sound like he says, I ate too many drugs? Listen again. Uh, 
I can't make that out. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. Did it appear that Mr. Floyd said, I ate too many drugs? Yes, it did. Having heard it in context, are you able to tell um, what Mr. Floyd is saying there? Yes, I believe Mr. Floyd was saying, I ain't do no drugs. We will continue to follow this trial and bring you all of the latest developments as it continues. Coming up, remembering a great friend of the show who unexpectedly passed away yesterday. I'll reflect on the amazing life of my friend, Midwin Charles, when we return in 60 seconds. just give you a little snapshot about what Haiti is. In 1804, Haiti became the first free black republic in the world, okay? They kicked out the French and decided that they were going to have liberty and they were going to govern themselves. And as a result, they became a beacon for other Latin American countries and the like for liberty and for democracy. And so starting with that and, and culminating to today, which happens to be the eighth year anniversary of an earthquake that decimated made it a country. Over 300,000 people lost their lives. So this idea that a group of people come from a country that is a shithole, and I'm going to say the word because it is the word that the president of these United States has used, is outrageous, it's degrading. And I will tell you this about Haitian people, you are not going to meet a group of people who are more resilient, who are more educated, who have more dignity, who are more hardworking, who have more respect, um, and who want to do nothing more than to contribute to this country and to this world. That was our dear friend and colleague, Midwin Charles in 2018 responding to controversial comments that former President Trump made about the country her parents came from, Haiti. I was absolutely devastated yesterday when I heard the news that she had passed away. Her voice was an important one for the Haitian community. She was also a kick-ass attorney and a great person who had a great personality. I got to know Midwin through some of her many appearances on MSNBC and then here, right here, on this show, she's been a guest. From the first day we met until the last time I actually talked to her, she was always just kind and generous. It's like she had a light. You know, some people walk around with a spotlight on them and they sort of have this glow. Um, I feel like she was one of those people and in every single room she walked in, um, she was that person. Her family released a statement last night that reads in part, she was known to many as a legal commentator on television. But to us, she was a devoted daughter, sister, aunt, niece, and cousin. Our lives are forever changed, and we will miss her for a lifetime. Joining me now is Rosemont Pierre-Louis. She is the CEO of the McSilver Institute at NYU. She was also a close friend of Midwin, and also one of my friends as well. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight on what I am certain is a, a very difficult day. Thank you so much, Serlina, uh, for having me. You were connected to Midwin in so many ways. You were both lawyers, um, both passionate about social justice uh, and the Haitian community. So tell us a, a little bit about your relationship and the bonds you formed through your work with the Haitian Roundtable. Sure, thanks again for having me. And uh, let me just say on behalf of the Haitian Roundtable and the the Haitian American community, we are 
really devastated by this loss and um, extend our condolences to the entire entire uh, family of uh, of Minwin's family. Um, so Minwin and I are both attorneys, and we met. Um, uh, in early 2007, uh, during my time in government, and a colleague connected us. And uh, as soon as we met, we connected on our passion for social justice and the law, certainly our connection with our heritage. Midwin was not only a fantastic lawyer, but she was also someone who was um, deeply committed to the Haitian community and wanted to be a voice. Uh, she was also someone who had dreams and ambitions, and part of that was really offering her thought leadership as a woman of color um, in uh, various forums, whether it's on TV, uh, with MSNBC, Zerlina, with your show. Uh, and certainly uh, she was a friend uh, to so many organizations and um, just, um, kind and generous, and I agree, just an incredible light, and someone who was just always available to support and uplift our community. I don't know that I ever asked her for anything and got a no. Not ever in, in, in a decade of, of knowing her, no matter what it was, whether it was like, can you do this thing to help me with my book, yes. Can you can you do this thing to help me with the campaign back in 2016? Yes, I'm there. She was always um, there. T speak to, in the last minute here, um, just what she meant to the community, Haitian American community in Brooklyn specifically. She was born and raised in Brooklyn, so proud of being from Brooklyn and living in Brooklyn. Um, and she was she was a prominent face. I mean, a lot of these pictures are from events. She was always, you know, out and about on the town, you know, being the light. So Midwin gave her uh, time to support organizations like the Haitian American Lawyers Association of New York, um, our medical association, the Haitian Ladies Network. I mean, she was just so generous with her time. And I agree with you. You would ask Minwin to do something for the Haitian Roundtable where she served as a board member. She would always agree to moderate events, to lend her name, to help us expand our visibility. And she was just a real sister. And of course, appearing on TV with uh, uh, people like you and Karine Jean-Pierre and our sister Yamiche, just... I mean, talk about uh, not only black girl magic, but Haitian girl magic. She is the embodiment of grace, brilliance, and we will just miss her so much. I'm gonna miss her dearly. Rosemont Pierre-Louis, thank you so much for being here. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina Maxwell, the Mehdi Hassan Show is coming up after a short break, right here on Peacock.
Tonight, the Biden administration holds new Iran nuclear talks. Will the president be able to keep his campaign promise to re-enter the nuclear deal and avoid a war? Plus, Gatesgate. Donald Trump finally weighs in as a report emerges that the Florida congressman, one of his staunchest allies, sought a blanket pardon. Also, blurred lines. Get the feeling that Selena Meyer was not so much satire as a coming attraction? The producer behind Veep joins us tonight to talk about the political scandal he's tackling next. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. It was one of Joe Biden's biggest campaign promises to restore the Obama-era nuclear deal between the United States and Iran that kept Tehran's atomic ambitions in check and that Donald Trump tore up. When we had an Iran deal, we had verifiability. Cut off every one of Iran's pathways to a nuclear weapon. International inspectors repeatedly confirmed Iran's compliance, as did our own intelligence agencies of that agreement. And one of the greatest threats to the stability of the region and global security was off the table. But now that he's in the White House, Biden is finding this week in particular that getting back into the deal is not so easy. To understand why that's the case, you have to know how we got here. In July 2015, after nearly two years of negotiations, Iran, the US, Great Britain, France, Russia, China and Germany reached a landmark agreement, the JCPOA. Iran would dismantle critical parts of its nuclear research and agree to curbs on uranium enrichment. In return, the US and its allies would gradually lift existing sanctions on Iran and let the nation pursue a more modest civilian nuclear power program. That deal, hailed by non-proliferation experts, made Republicans lose their minds, especially Republicans hoping to take over the White House from Barack Obama. Ted Cruz said the deal would make Obama the leading financier of terrorism against America in the world. Mike Huckabee said the nuclear deal was, quote, marching the Israelis to the door of the oven, a remark that the Anti-Defamation League blasted as unacceptable. But Cruz and Huckabee both took a backseat to Donald J. Trump, the eventual Republican nominee. In 2018, then-President Trump unilaterally pulled the U.S. out of the Iran Accord, a document I'm betting he's never even read. Even though the U.S. intel community had verified twice in 2017 that Iran was keeping its end of the deal. Over the rest of his presidency, Trump imposed roughly 1,600 new sanctions on Iran as part of a campaign of, quote, maximum pressure that the Trump White House said would force Tehran to do better. But predictably, it did the exact opposite. Iran began enriching more weapons-grade uranium. By the end of Trump's presidency, Iran had gone from having about 200 pounds of said uranium under the Obama deal to two and a half tons of it, a 12-fold increase, an increase so great that Trump considered attacking Iran before he left office. But senior advisers talked him out of it. Now, it appears both sides finally want a return to the deal but can't agree how to get there. In Vienna, the same city where the 2015 deal was struck, US and Iranian officials began talking this week, albeit indirectly, with European officials mediating between the two sides. The goal? To simply return to where they were half a decade ago. But the US says it wants Iran to get back into compliance with the 2015 deal first, before it will lift sanctions. And Iran, understandably, says that the U.S. should lift the Trump-era sanctions first. And the U.S. administration at one time felt that they want to leave the deal. You are the one who has left the deal. You have to come back to the deal. And then we sit on the table within the framework of the 5 plus 1 and talk whatever issues that are deemed to be talked about. And as if the negotiations were not hard enough already. They got a little harder today. Early this morning, an Iranian military vessel in the Red Sea was attacked and disabled by an explosive mine. An American official told the New York Times that Israeli authorities had notified the U.S. that they were responsible for that attack. Israeli officials are not publicly taking credit for the mine attack, but hawkish and embattled Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has always opposed the nuclear agreement with Iran, and he seems intent now on scuttling its future prospects. The deal didn't push war further away, it actually brought it closer. The deal didn't reduce Iran's aggression, it dramatically increased it. 
What does Joe Biden plan to do about all of this? As president, he's shown he can put domestic reforms on a fast track. He will push Republicans, bypass them when necessary, to achieve progressive goals. But on foreign policy, on a signature campaign promise to restore regional and global stability, he has not proven nearly as focused or determined. And that could cost not just him, but all of us. Remember, you can pass all the infrastructure bills you want, but it will mean very little if you get embroiled in another preventable Middle East war. Joining me now to discuss this is Joe Cirincioni, distinguished fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He's the author of Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late. And he consulted with the Obama White House during the JCPOA negotiations back in 2015. Joe, thanks for coming on the show. What do you make of these talks in Vienna so far? We're hearing positive news from the Americans, from the Iranians, from the Europeans. Is it too soon for us to get our hopes up about the US re-entering the deal? Because you wrote a piece today saying, quote, it might be possible, but not if President Joe Biden listens to those saying to drop the agreement for a better deal. Mm. That's exactly right. The, the news out of Vienna is encouraging. There are solid work going on. They've broken up into working groups. They're trying to detail exactly what Iran would do to go back into compliance with the original deal. The machines they'd have to dismantle, the, the uh, uranium gas they would have to export, etc. On the other side, the U.S. will then detail exactly what sanctions it would lift and when it would lift them. Once they have those two roadmaps, they will try to synchronize them into a comprehensive agreement. Could that happen by Friday? It's unclear. It might take a week or more. They are racing against the clock. Inside the Biden administration, there's now an understanding yeah. that they have waited a little bit too long. And they're trying to bring that focus yeah. and discipline that they have in the domestic agenda over to this crucial foreign policy issue. You talk about the clock and trying to beat the clock and the delay that we've seen. Uh, the White House said today, this is just, quote, a beginning period. It's going to be a long process. But how urgent is this issue right now of Iran? The LA Times reported that some Pentagon there, there officials are... think the tensions are so severe that it might not be possible to delay further, that without a deal restricting the Iranian nuclear program, the choice becomes to watch Iran march closer to the ability to build a bomb or to go to war to stop it. War, is that on the horizon? That's exactly right. You have to remember, that's the situation we were in in 2010, 2011, 2012, before we started negotiating. Israel was threatening to bomb the Iran uh, nuclear sites. They're threatening that again. Israel thinks that, that they not only want to uh, stop the Iranian nuclear program, they want to overthrow the government of Iran. And they have support from Saudi Arabia, from monarchists who want to put the Shah, the former dictator's son, back on the throne, reestablish the monarchy. And of course, the, the GOP here, who opposes any foreign policy success for the Biden administration. They're racing against two yes. clocks. One, the Iranian elections are about to take place in June. In a couple of weeks, that's going to freeze the negotiations because President Rouhani, the pragmatic president of Iran, his opponents don't want him to get credit. They would like to have a hard line uh, alternative candidate elected in yeah. the June elections. And that can't, that administration wouldn't take office till September. And the other is what you highlighted. Israel is waging a covert or not so covert war again against Iran, assassinating scientists, bombing Iranian sites in Syria, and now openly attacking Iranian ships. There were just too many flashpoints in the, in the region. If you don't have a deal with Iran, I fear that yeah. one of these flashpoints is going to explode into a larger conflict. You mentioned, and that is a truly scary thought, it's why we decided to lead the show on this story today, but you mentioned Iranian elections. Let's talk about how the Iranians are looking at this, a perspective that's often ignored here in Washington, D.C. They've been under this devastating sanctions regime. The U.S. under Donald Trump imposed an additional 1,600 sanctions, which has put everyday Iranians through no fault of their own, under a lot of strain. Uh, Iranian officials are playing tough now, refusing to meet with US officials, saying, lift the sanctions before we agree to anything. Is their position fair, number one? And number two, is it inflexible? You've met with top Iranian officials, you've met with President Rouhani. How stuck on it are they? Well, legally and logically, the US should re-enter the agreement first. We're the ones who broke it 
Iran has been complying with the agreement. Trump yeah. left it in May 2018. The Iranians waited a full year before they started slowly uh, exceeding the limits on their program. Everything they've done, though, has been calculated to be quickly reversible. They could probably come back into compliance in a few months if they know that they're going to get the sanctions relief. So, yes, they have a logical and actually fairly legal position on this. The, the problem is neither side trusts the other. So we're probably going to have to have a compliance for compliance step by step procedure so that each side can see that the other is fulfilling their agreements. I think we can get this done. The signs are positive, but there are hardline opponents in both Tehran and in Washington who are trying to put a stick in the spokes. This can be undermined by activities on yes. the ground by the Revolutionary and Guard. It can be undermined by U.S. senators. So that's the risk. Both presidents are fighting their opponents in their capitals as well as negotiating with each other. Yes. And as you pointed out, there's the Israeli role as well. Uh, you have uh, this week the Vienna uh, talks uh, lauded as constructive and successful by different parties. And then according to the Times, New York Times, Israel notified the U.S. that it struck an Iranian vessel. We know that Bibi and Biden are old friends. Is the Biden administration going to allow what looks like an Israeli attempt to undermine negotiations, do you think? Uh, it's going to resist it. And we went through this back in 2013, 2014 as well. The Israelis were, and the Saudis poured everything they could into this. There were well-funded campaigns with ads targeting um, what they considered uh, persuadable senators on this. There's the uh, uh, Israeli lobby in Washington that's very effective, that's pressing. There are Democratic senators like Robert Menendez, the hawkish chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, that are trying to sink this deal, too. So this is going to be a tough political fight. That's why we wish Joe Biden had done this early in the administration when he corrected the other damage that Biden had done in the climate accords by leaving the World Health Organization, etc. He should have rejoined then. This would have been over. The Iranians would have been back into compliance, and we'd already probably be engaged yeah. in another round of talks. To, uh, to follow on agreements to make this deal longer, stronger, and address the other regional issues yeah. we care about. Yeah, and just to be clear, I think you meant to say the pro-Israeli lobby uh, in D.C., the various lobbying organizations uh, in Washington, D.C., there are a lot of hawkish groups putting a lot of pressure on this administration, as you say. Uh, I only hope that the administration will resist uh, that, haw that hawkish lobbying that we see so often in Washington, D.C., across the board. Uh, Joe Serencioni, thank you so much for your insights tonight. I appreciate it. As these Vienna talks continue, it's relevant to remember the Biden administration does not speak for all Democrats. And perhaps nowhere is that more apparent than on the subject of Iran. In fact, last month, before the talks were announced, hawkish Democratic senators like Robert Menendez of New Jersey joined with Lindsey Graham in leading 41 other senators to write a letter to Biden on Iran, urging him to come up with a grand plan that addresses everything from the nuclear issue to the release of US citizens in Iranian prisons. It's the kind of deal that will likely never be agreed on. It's a raising of the bar, and as we just discussed, only serves to delegitimize the effort to rejoin the pre-existing 2015 JCPOA. So how will Biden and his administration navigate these politically complicated waters domestically in D.C. on Capitol Hill, especially when Biden promised last fall he would rejoin the agreement as a starting point? Joining me to talk about all this is Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego, who sits on the House Armed Services Committee and served as a Marine in Iraq uh, during that Middle East conflict. Congressman, thank you for coming back on the show. President Biden says he wants to rejoin a nuclear deal with Iran. But Jared Kushner last month, he called Biden's Iran strategy so far smart and says the administration revealed that only a new framework can bring stability for the future. I mean, am I wrong, Congressman, to say that if Jared Kushner's praising your Iran policy, your Iran policy is probably wrong? Well, I mean, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but I think the most, thing, the most important thing we need to focus on is bringing stability at least to the tensions that are right now. Uh, step one. Step two is, you know, we do have to in earnestly get back into the JCPOA. Uh, I think that will bring down tensions on both sides and also, of course, bring down tensions and, and pressure coming from all over both our uh, allies in the Middle East, such as Israel and even our allies in, in Europe. However, you know, we do have to focus on the grander, uh, you know, idea of what we need to do to really fully have a comprehensive stabilization plan in the Middle East, because we can take care of JCPOA. And I think that's what we should do first. 
But then we have to kind of go and start talking about the other problems that exist with Iran being a malign actor in that area. But this whole idea, I, w- I will say this, this whole idea that we need to restart and have this grand plan is not realistic. I think some people actually know that it's not realistic yeah. and would and are only steering us into greater conflict when we should really take this in, in measured steps. It's a very good point you make there. On that note, the people who are pitching, let's get a better deal, when they really mean, let's just stop any deals from happening because they prefer conflict. How much sway do you think Iran hawks in DC and both parties have as Biden goes forward? They were pretty successful in getting Trump to pull out of the deal in 2018. I actually think that the, uh, the the Iran hawk, whatever you want to clarify them and call them, don't have as much power as they used to. There is a strain within Trump and within uh, the, the Trumpism and within Republicans that really has come out in the last couple of years that, you know, is trying to be, I would say, more uh, drawing back uh uh, against foreign intervention. And I think that aligns with a lot of the perspective, of a lot of Democrats, especially progressives, that we want to see peaceful solutions to bring stability in the Middle East that also takes us out of there. Uh, you know, strategically speaking, it makes no sense for us to continue to have these types of engagements in the Middle East when we really have bigger and, and, and harder problems coming up. Uh, and so uh, I think those two things uh, again, with some of the some of the my conservative colleagues that you know I think are really uh, pushing back against uh, military intervention in the Middle East, uh, yeah. can be a really good stepping stone for uh, uh, President Biden to move in the right direction. So, in the meantime, there is a pressing humanitarian crisis in Iran as a result of the pandemic. And of course, one of the stumbling blocks is, when do you lift Trump era sanctions, 1600 odd extra sanctions? Uh, During Trump's maximum pressure uh, sanctions campaign, you had all these extra sanctions that were added. Uh, The cost of basic goods in Iran doubled by last January. The price of beef rose nearly 50%. The cost of things like milk rose by 100%. These are ordinary Iranians, nothing to do with the government who are suffering. Is there not a humanitarian imperative to remove these economic sanctions, at least during this global pandemic. Even Joe Biden said last year that the US should take steps to offer relief to some of the hardest hit nations, including Iran. But that hasn't really happened since he entered office. Haven't heard much about that. Well, I think there's both a uh, humanitarian, but also a strategic reason why we should be doing this, right? This is an opportunity for us to really align ourselves with most of the Iranian public, Iranian street that is largely Western in in their thought and want to be accepted back into the World Forum, using the, you know, uh, humanitarian reasons for us to lift uh, COVID uh, restrictions, to allow us to bring, allow them to import, Iranians import uh, the vaccines they need, the PPE they need, things of that nature, I think does not diminish our position uh, in in the region. Certainly, I think only elevates our position in the world. At the same time, could be a really good fig leaf and opening uh, in terms of our, um, you know, our hopeful uh, eventual negotiations when it comes to JCPOA. Uh, but the last thing we want really is to punish citizens for the actions of their malign yes. leaders. Uh, and we know that, unfortunately, that Iran is a very young and progressive population with an old and regressive leadership. Uh, but the, mo- the amount of uh, pressure so- that is being felt right now is actually on the families of Iran and not on the leadership of Iran. So one last question before I let you go. You're a veteran congressman of the Iraq war, having served there in the early years of the US-led invasion. I believe uh, you lost your best friend there in combat. Uh, In 2019, when news came out, the White House was reviewing military plans with Iran. You tweeted, these generals and policy experts will never know what a young enlisted Marine experiences in modern combat, and that sending troops to Iran, going to war with them is something that will not make us any safer. Do you think American politicians are too quick to always float the idea of war as a solution to our foreign policy problems. This idea of Congress being filled with quote unquote chicken hawks, people who haven't served in armed conflict, but are happy to sign off on new wars every couple of years. I do. Uh, look, you, you don't really know the price of war until you have to talk to one of your, your, your friend's widow um, or their kids. And um, you have too many people in Congress and in leadership that think war is some type of, you know, ha- uh, you know, amped up game of risk, when in reality you're dealing with people's lives, and not just U- just U.S. troops. Um, you know, I- unfortunately, there are also, you know, innocent people in Iraq that died because of uh, of war, right? So we need to slow down this this pace. I'm not afraid of war. I'm afraid of unjust wars, 
and I'm afraid of really stupid wars that only take away from our real national interest and what we should be doing. Uh, and I think you do have too many chicken hawks that just don't really understand what will happen if we go into a real regional conflict of, of, of this nature. This is not going to be a one day or two day thing. Uh, this is going to be something that'll drag on. It'll drag down our own national interests. Yeah. That'll really, you know, create a regional conflict that I think could have horrible ramifications for generations to come. Yeah. Peace is is always an option. We should at least always try that first. Well said. And as you say, uh, thousands of American soldiers and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis died in a stupid, a very stupid and unjust war. Uh, Congressman Ruben Gallego, thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Now to Minneapolis, where numerous experts have taken the stand to discuss former officer Derek Chauvin's use of force and whether it was responsible for the death of George Floyd. Today, a use of force expert with the LAPD shared his findings. That force uh, being applied then for the restraint period, which you've defined as nine minutes and 29 seconds, would constitute deadly force? Yes. And what is that opinion? That it would. Why is that? Because at the time of the restraint period, Mr. Floyd was not resisting. He was in, in the prone position. Um, he, he was handcuffed. He was not uh, attempting to uh, evade. He was not attempting to resist. And the pressure um, that he was, that was being caused by the body weight uh, would, uh, could cause positional asphyxia, which could cause death. One of the expert witnesses today actually took back his interpretation of what Floyd was saying during his arrest. James Ryerson initially testified that Floyd said, I ate too many drugs, but then backtracked. Having heard it in context, are you able to tell um, what Mr. Floyd is saying there? Yes, I believe Mr. Floyd was saying, I ain't do no drugs. A big difference there. The prosecution ended the day with forensic science testimony and is expected to continue with medical experts tomorrow. When we return, Gates Gate just keeps getting weirder and now Donald Trump is throwing his two cents into the mix. I know you're on pins and needles to find out what he had to say. That's coming up in 60 seconds. Don't go away. this show on Sunday, I asked if former President Donald Trump would come to the defense of his greatest ally, Matt Gates, who is the subject of a federal criminal sex trafficking investigation. Gates has denied having sex with a 17 year old, denied paying for sex, and he's not been charged with a crime. But in regards to Trump, well, it looks like we have our answer. Trump released this statement today. Congressman Matt Gates has never asked me for a pardon. He goes on to say, it must also be remembered that he has totally denied the accusations against him. Notice how carefully phrased that Trump statement is. And also remember, the former president is a pathological liar. According to the New York Times, Gates did privately ask the Trump White House for blanket preemptive pardons for himself and unidentified congressional allies for any crimes they may have committed or been accused of committing. That's according to two people told of the discussions. This report has not been confirmed by NBC News. A, a, a spokesman, excuse me, for Gates denied that he privately requested a pardon in connection with the ongoing Justice Department inquiry. According to the Times, at the time Gates asked for the pardon, the congressman was under investigation over whether he'd violated sex trafficking laws, though it was unclear if Gates 
or the White House knew of the inquiry. The article goes on to say that Trump associates have speculated that Gates' request for a group pardon was an attempt to camouflage his own potential criminal exposure. It also mentions Gates' memoir, where he touted how close his relationship had become with Donald Trump. He says, the president has called me when I was in my car asleep in the middle of the night on my Longworth office cot on the throne, on airplanes, in nightclubs, and even in the throes of passion. Oh, that's more information than anyone cared to know. TMI, Congressman. TMI. According to the article, since the investigation came to light last week, Trump's advisers have urged him to stay quiet and have tried to distance him from Gates. So, all this time, was Gates just cozying up to the president in hopes that Trump would rescue him from a sex trafficking investigation? Or is this all just a $25 million extortion scheme, as Gates claims, to extort him and his family? Here to discuss is Florida State Representative Anna Eskimani. She's calling on Gates to resign from Congress. Uh, Representative Eskimani, thanks so much for coming on the show. Does asking for a pardon make Matt Gates look guilty or is he just being careful? It makes him look incredibly guilty. The fact that he is proactively searching for a way out is, is very reflective of the fact that he knew he was in trouble. And unfortunately, we're now learning that even more uh, Republican Florida politicians were seeking different types of uh, attempts to avoid being connected to Matt Gates and, being, and getting attention for some of their past decisions. Yeah, I mean, the whole wider Florida swampy GOP politics has all been brought to light by uh, these latest investigations and claims. I just wonder, though, how likely do you think it is that Trump didn't know Gates was under federal investigation? How could he have not gotten word of it from his own attorney general, who, lest we forget, Bill Barr is the one who signed off on this. As much as Matt Gates was claiming in an op-ed earlier this week that this is the Garland, the DOJ targeting him, this started under Bill Barr. A hundred percent. I mean, and again, we have to remember that President Trump has a track record of lie after lie after lie to the point where even Republicans have tried to avoid uh, being caught up in his lies. And so it's pretty clear that he is not a strong uh, validator for Congressman Matt Gates. And of course, Matt Gates has been one of his most loyal uh, 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 members in Congress. So it doesn't surprise me that the president is trying to protect him. Yeah, without uh, questioning uh, Matt Gaetz's, uh, you know, denials of these accusations, his claims of innocence, all I would note is that Donald Trump was willing to pardon convicted war criminals. Um, but clearly he says he wasn't asked. Uh, the Times says he was, but they didn't offer one. Who knows? Uh, we will find out more, I'm sure, in the coming days. Uh, Representative, you've had your own strange interactions with Matt Gates and his so-called wingman, Joel Greenberg, uh, the Seminole County tax collector who's been charged with an array of crimes, including child sex trafficking. I want to talk about this bizarre voicemail you received from Gates and Greenberg in 2019. Uh, let's have a listen to a part of it. Dear Anna, this is your favorite tax collector. I'm up in the panhandle with your favorite U.S. Congressman, Mr. Gates. Hi, Anna. And uh, we were just chatting about you and talking about your lovely qualities. And your... We think you're the future of the Democratic Party in Florida. Well, yeah, I know you're the future of it, so there's no thinking involved. Anyway, uh, if you get this and you feel like chatting, give me a shout back. We... Were you all, were the three of you all friends back then, or what was going on? And what do you make of that message now, in light of these allegations and charges against Greenberg in particular? We were never friends. And in fact, when I saw that my phone was ringing and it was Joel Greenberg calling, I did not pick up. And then when I listened to the voicemail that was left for me, I was surprised to get this type of message, just the tone of it, the... Uh, when it seemed to be an attempt to engage with me on a more intimate level versus a professional level. And I did not call back or text back. And honestly, I just put it aside as another experience of being a woman in politics today. But after learning about their friendship and the crimes they've committed, uh, the, the, the investigation around these alleged crimes they've committed, I felt compelled to, to find that voicemail and share it with the world because it just demonstrates, A, the boys club mentality that they both practice and, of course, B, the relationship they had together. Yeah, a weird call. And just to be clear for our viewers, um, Joel Greenberg has been charged with multiple crimes, which he denies. Uh, Matt Gates has not been charged with any crimes uh, as of right now. Uh, you've called, though, for Matt Gates, despite him not being charged with a crime, to resign from Congress. He says he won't do it. 
He says he's innocent. Uh, there aren't many other options out there for holding him to account or sanctioning him in the meantime, are there? We discussed this on the show last night, but federal and state legislatures don't really have the HR procedures that regular workplaces have and that they would deploy for any other employee accused of this kind of stuff. Resignation is really the only option, Menti. I mean, when you look at Congressman Matt Gates' history in the Florida legislature, a body that I am proud to serve in, um, we already have rumors of a point system that he and others played, treating women as objects. And the reality is that this is part of a long history of behavior. He should not be in public office to begin with. And the more and more we learn about this scandal, it's pretty clear to me that he is not able to serve publicly with ethics in mind. Yeah, I mean, it's a real problem right now uh, in politics, uh, holding people to account. Uh, but I appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Florida State Representative Anna Eskimani, thank you for your time. We need to be very clear. It's not just Republican men who are accused of awful, outrageous things and resort to outlandish defenses. Virginia Democrat Justin Fairfax is the state's lieutenant governor and has faced two accusations of sexual assault himself. But his strategy for dealing with these scandals, these accusations, might sound familiar. First, Fairfax denied an anonymous accusation of sexual assault published on a conservative news blog in 2019. But then the accuser identified herself, saying that what began as consensual kissing became assault while they were both attending the Democratic National Convention in July 2004. Just days after that, a second woman came forward accusing him of a, quote, premeditated and aggressive attack in 2000 while they were both undergrads at Duke. Democratic representatives, including the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, called for his resignation. But did Fairfax resign? Did he even apologize? Nope. Instead, he's seeking a promotion, running for the top executive job in his state, a bid for governor. At last night's Democratic gubernatorial debate in Virginia, he even said those accusations and the people who believe them made him a victim on the order of, I kid you not, George Floyd and Emmett Till. Take a listen. I was falsely accused uh, in 2019 uh, from uh, the Washington Post now saying these false accusations, uh, make, raising that question, uh, and whether it was a rush to judgment. Everyone here on the stage called for my immediate resignation, including Terry McAuliffe three minutes after a press release came out. He treated me uh, like George Floyd. Uh, he treated me like Emmett Till, no due process. Immediately assumed my guilt. There are a few things that make that claim not only ludicrous, but deeply offensive from the start. First of all, Fairfax is alive, which cannot be said of Emmett Till or George Floyd, both of whom lost their lives. And on top of being alive, Fairfax still has his job. He's still the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. George Floyd lost more than his job. He lost his entire life. Emmett Till didn't even live long enough to join a workforce. Fairfax still gets to stand up on a statewide platform and defend himself, which again, Floyd and Till never even had the chance to do. It borders on sacrilegious to use the hallowed memory of these two slain African Americans to elevate himself beyond accusations that besides his own denial are by all accounts credible. It's one thing for a politician to deny accusations of sexual assault. It's another thing entirely to make yourself into a martyr and abuse the memory and names associated with the civil rights struggle. For more on this, I'm joined by Danielle Moody. She's the host of the Democracy-ish podcast and co-host of the podcast Woke AF Daily. Uh, Danielle, thanks for coming on the show. I mean, putting the accusations of sexual assault themselves to the side for a moment. Just talk about Lieutenant Governor Fairfax last night comparing himself to the likes of George Floyd and Emmett Till. I mean, it's astonishing that you would do that at this point in time. I mean, we are right now in the throes of the Derek Chauvin trial against the murder of George yes. Floyd that we all watched in a viral video for nine minutes and 29 seconds. And so the idea that as America is literally a powder keg, that you would want to equate yourself, that you would think that the accusations that have been against you is equatable to a murder that we all saw in Broad Daylight or what sparked the civil rights movement in terms of the killing of Emmett Till is outrageous at best, right? And ridiculous. And so I, I'm embarrassed yeah. for him at this particular moment. And the fact that, look, we, America is a racist country. We know that, right? We, we, we can see the patterns of behavior throughout this country's history. But what he is being charged with, what he's being accused of 
has nothing to do with him being black. And it reminds me, it harkens back to Thomas Clarence, uh, to Clarence Thomas, excuse me, calling Anita Hill's accusations against him a high tech lynching, if you remember that. And that, I mean, this yes. you're talking about 20, 30 years ago, but I was astonished. Like, who would use that kind of phrasing? That's a good right? point. And so I, I'm not quite, sh- I'm not quite it's sure a- uh, what Lieutenant Governor Fairfax was thinking, but this was not it. This was not the move. It's a very good reminder, the Clarence Thomas reminder, because, of course, Anita Hill was a black woman. The idea that this, ha- that, you know, that it was a racist attack on him when it was a black woman accusing him of sexual misconduct. Um, does it actually even help his case, his denying of these accusations with such a hyperbolic claim uh, to victimhood? I mean, I just don't even understand the political strategy behind it. You know, I was trying, as you were replaying it, I'm trying to understand who the audience was, right? Like who he thought that the audience for this kind of rhetoric was. Because if you are a black person in Virginia, I can't imagine that the hearkening again to George Floyd's murder, which we are reliving in real time right now, is going to be what puts you over the top in the Democratic primary. And then if you are looking for the votes of white people in Virginia, I can't think about how equating yourself to these two very high profile racialized murders is going to endear you to those people either. So this was a lose-lose strategy. And even his own spokespeople coming out and saying, you know, there, there is these similarities. No, there are not. And what bothers me most about yeah. Justin Fairfax it, the, is the fact that he never even came out and said, I understand these women. I, you know, they have the right to speak out. He didn't offer anything. It was completely defensiveness from the beginning. And your your point about the spokesperson suggests that it was a pre-planned soundbite. It's not something he just accidentally said in the heat of the moment in the middle of a debate, which makes you have to question it even more. Just looking at the big picture, Danielle, you have Andrew Cuomo, governor of New York, despite calls for him to resign from some of the most senior Democrats in that state, multiple allegations of sexual harassment, misconduct against him that he denies, to be clear. You have Justin Fairfax, who didn't resign as lieutenant governor of Virginia, is now running for governor. Is there an issue with Democrats trying to hold Trump and co to account for their alleged misdeeds, while prominent Democrats aren't exactly setting the best of examples here? You know, I will say that Democrats generally, right, when we look at what happened to Al Franken in the Senate, right, when we when we see his expulsion from the Senate because his colleagues said that it was time for him to resign, is that Democrats usually hold their folks to hire Uh, to higher regard, to higher standards than Republicans do. I mean, the Republican Party, as we look at it right now, is filled with pedophiles and racists. So, you know, they have no standards and and gun toters, right, that want to put their other colleagues on, you know, on on poster boards with a with markers on their backs, right, for them to be shot. And so there are not real standards that Republicans operate on. Democrats usually do. And so in this instance right now, I mean, many people called for for Justin Fairfax to resign and he refuses. He's looking for a promotion, like you said, which is outrageous. Yeah, and just to be clear, the Republican Party is undoubtedly filled with racists, but in terms of the pedophile charge, those are accusations, those are charges against Joel Greenberg. Uh, No one has been found guilty of it in a court of law. I just want to clarify that for our viewers. But Danielle Moody, uh, appreciate the rest of your insights tonight. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Still ahead, Trump throws his support behind Mo Brooks for the Alabama Senate seat. His complete and total endorsement. Think you know who Mo Brooks is? Well, probably not. And I think it's time you were formally introduced to this particular Trumpy congressman. That's next in 60 seconds.
I know a lot of you think we should just ignore Donald Trump right now, we the media. Ignore him. After all, he's no longer president, so who cares what he has to say? And I get that. But sadly, painfully, we can't really do that. Donald Trump still basically controls the Republican Party. Today, Trump endorsed Alabama Congressman Mo Brooks in his bid for the Senate. Brooks announced his run last month for a vacant, for a soon-to-be vacant Alabama Senate seat with none other than former Trump advisor Stephen Miller in attendance. You know, the guy behind stealing brown kids from their parents. And in deep red Alabama, a Trump endorsement means Brooks will very likely be the state's next senator. So who exactly is Mo Brooks? The Alabama congressman has gone all in on the widespread voter fraud lie and was among the first to say he'd object to the electoral college vote. And then on January the 6th, during the Save America rally in DC, prior to the riot, Brooks famously said this. Today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. We already know what happened after that rally ended, and Brooks rightly got hammered for his speech, which critics say helped incite the January 6th violence. Brooks, though, refused to apologize and argued that he was clearly talking about the 2022 and 2024 elections, taking down those candidates politically. Yeah, right. And I suppose these comments from two weeks earlier from him were also about elections? Well, this is pretty much it uh, for our country. This is a pivotal moment in American history. In my judgment, it rivals the election of 1860 between uh, Douglas and Lincoln, and we saw what ensued from that. And then on January the 6th, this is somewhat akin to the Alamo, although I hope we will survive. The Civil War, the Alamo. That doesn't sound like concern over future elections to me. Sounds like incitement to violence. Brooks was also one of the congressmen name-dropped by Ali Alexander, a far-right leader of the Stop the Steal movement. In a now deleted Periscope video, Alexander claimed Brooks was helping him plan the January 6th rally. I was the person who came up with the January 6th idea with Congressman Gosar, Congressman Mo Brooks, and then Congressman Andy Biggs. We four schemed up of putting maximum pressure on Congress while they were voting so that who we couldn't lobby, we could change the hearts and the minds of Republicans who were in that body hearing our loud war from outside. Alexander offered no proof for his claims, which Biggs denied and Gosar offered no comment on. Brooks' office told us he spoke at the D.C. rally at the invitation of the White House and in no way coordinated with Alexander. Despite the January 6th violence, Brooks held strong to his electoral college objection and false claims of fraud, even suggesting after the violence that a million, quote, illegal immigrants voted for Joe Biden. And it gets worse. The congressman has a long history of racism, bigotry, xenophobia. In March 2019, he took to the House floor to slam, quote, socialist Democrats and the media over the Mueller report, saying they should atone for their sin of perpetuating, perpetuating what he called the biggest political lie in American history. He then proceeded to read a passage from Mein Kampf on the House floor in an attempt to compare Democrats to Nazis. The ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, slammed Brooks's analogy, calling it unconscionable and dangerous. Yeah, Mein Kampf. But of course, there's more. In an August 2019 radio interview, Brooks griped about, quote, the growing influence of the Islamic religion in the Democratic Party ranks and said electing more and more people like Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib would make the Democratic Party strongly anti-Jewish and anti-Israel. This guy, who spews bigotry and racism and lies about election fraud, he wants to be a senator, and he's got a serious shot at winning. We can look away all we want and pretend people like Mo Brooks are fringe figures. But sadly, they're not. Not anymore. Remember Marjorie Taylor Greene, the freshman congresswoman? She just raised over $3 million in her first three months in office. This is it. This is the modern GOP, no longer a conservative party with an extremist fringe. It's an extremist party with a conservative fringe. When we return, shows like Veep went from being comedies to crystal balls in the Trump era. And guess what? Not much has changed. I'll be joined by Veep showrunner and executive producer David Mandel after a short break.
Whoever predicted that the world of politics would get less absurd once Donald Trump left office didn't count on having a conspiracy theorist who blamed wildfires on a Jewish space laser and a Second Amendment-loving gun-themed restaurant owner who doesn't realize that amending the Constitution means you've changed it, duking it out for Republican Freshman of the Year in the House. That's not a good thing. They didn't count on Mitch McConnell learning the hard way that what Citizens United createth, well, it can also take awayeth. McConnell has been very explicit in saying that corporations are people only when they're writing big checks to Republicans. No, really, that's what he said. If I were running a major corporation, I'd stay out of politics. I'm, I'm not talking about political contributions. Shut up and give me all your money. McConnell tried to clarify today by pretty much repeating what he said and insulting corporations. So that's going well for him and the GOP. And the 2021 will be more boring, folks. Also didn't count on Congressman Matt Gates, any part of Matt Gates. The Florida congressman, as we discussed earlier, is the subject of a federal investigation over violating sex trafficking law, something he denies. And yet now we've learned that he's set to be the keynote speaker at, wait for it, a Women for America conference. That's a conservative women's group, in case you were wondering. Oh, and yes, the venue for Matt Gates to mansplain whatever to a room full of women is a Trump golf club. Because of course it is. How could Gates' speech be held anywhere else? Perhaps it wasn't just the Trump presidency that looked like an episode of Veep. Perhaps it's right-wing American politics as a whole these days. Joining me now is the perfect person to talk about this with, David Mandel, the executive producer of Veep. Uh, David, thanks so much for coming back on the show. It's been a while. Let me ask you this. What was your prediction for the absurdity quotient of 2021 political news once Trump left office? Did you think we'll get back to normal in 2021 under Joe Biden, or did you expect it to carry on being this crazy? I was definitely expecting more normal. I was honestly, and I do feel like we had like a month off. They kind of gave us a month. And then uh, it's, <laughs> it's just back, it's back to the crazy. Um, I also just want to take a moment to formally endorse whoever on the planet Earth runs against Mo Brooks. They have my endorsement. I just want to, uh, I watched your last segment. And uh, <laughs> yeah, whoever does quote, Mein Kampf has my endorsement. Uh, I mean, again, I I've said this before it's and I'll a, say it again. A, it's a very I, high I, bar I, to meet, isn't it, David? Yeah, it's a very I high bar. Write, if you don't quote Mein yeah. Kampf, go for yeah. the Senate in Alabama. Just, just my only piece of advice, don't quote Mein Kampf. Oh, I accidentally quoted Mein Kampf. I mean, it just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, can't write it. Indeed. That. Can't write it. Tell us about your new show, David. Tell us about your new show, The White House Plumbers, starring Woody Harrelson as E. Howard Hunt and Justin Theroux as G. Gordon Liddy, who died last week, of course. What is that all about? Remind us. Um, it's basically, it's a miniseries uh, for HBO that's basically going to kind of look at Watergate uh, through the perspective of the plumbers who, you know, did the break in Hunt and Liddy. And really, in some ways, it's sort of, in those early days of the, the dare I say, the conservative movement, it's it's the birth of the true believers, the true believers that almost kind of, you know, just are willing to sort of almost burn the whole thing down in the name of this, you know, this sort of, ins I, I, to me, insane uh, just uh, advocacy of what they think is right and why you're wrong. Um, whether, the, you know, again, that's, I think, what's interesting about it. And we're just, we're just sort of starting on the pre-production. We're going to hopefully start shooting in May. So we're kind of just rolling into it right now. Can't wait to see it. You're directing it. Obviously, as you say, uh, you're just yep. starting production. You've immersed yourself, I'm assuming, in that Nixonian world. A lot of people have compared Nixon and Trump. Who's more crooked? Who's more corrupt in your view? Um, in my view, and I, and I truly believe in history, when history kind of, you know, as we get a little further and we, we, we write about it, you know, there's that moment where even Nixon realized he had to resign. Um, that that just doesn't exist for Trump. The the level of yeah, personal corruption, the family, the money, his the children, the 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 pardons, I, just all of those things. The just the the hotel business. Do you know what I mean? It's just like it, at no point did Nixon yeah. ever open a restaurant in D.C. and make people go to it. Do you know what I mean? It's just a <laughs> whole other level yes. that. I'm, 
pretty sure the framers never counted on. It's just a very different thing um, that, uh, I, again, I do think we need a little distance, but the, the further we get, the worse it will seem, uh, is what I honestly believe about these Trump years. That it's being such a said, good point though, you make. It's... No, sorry, continue. Oh, I was just going to Say, but I do think what's really interesting is looking back on Nixon, and again that we're going to do a little of this in in, in our thing, is it, it 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 doesn't Trump becomes less shocking. This has been a slow journey to Trump. It, he didn't come out of nowhere. This has been going on, I guess, as far as I'm concerned, since Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act. That's that's the honest answer. There is a, a, yeah. a uh, just a hard line of racism that just colors all of this and gets us yeah. to Trump. And I'm sorry to say the modern Republican Party. And uh, I, I do really feel that way. And by looking backwards, yeah. you, you start to understand what's going on right now. A couple of things that come to mind as you were just speaking there. I mean, we talked about Mo Brooks in, in, in the earlier segment, and we talked about Donald Trump, we talked about Marjorie Taylor Greene. I mean, Richard Nixon, for all his many flaws, sins, and crimes, was a smart guy, was an intelligent person. Yes. Uh, no one ever questioned his intellect or his grasp of politics. These people are on a different level, level of kind of ignorance and conspiracism. And the other point you made is such a good point that Nixon agreed you know, at the end to give it up, whereas Trump is still putting out statements saying the election was stolen. He's putting out Easter statements, which are all about how yeah. the election was stolen for him. By the way, happy Easter, which reminds us just how off the, you know, how and in a different planet Donald Trump is. Yeah, and let's also point out that he is putting out statements. I mean, all along he's been putting out statements about how either now, obviously, it's they stole the election, but before the election that they were going to steal the election. And in those earlier statements about how the Democrats were going to steal the election, they were taking people's credit card numbers, bank account information, and emptying, emptying yes. their, uh, their own orders accounts of money in the name of stop we're going to steal from you and not tell you while we're accusing other people of stealing and that that's the the grand grift of this yes. entire thing that I, just throws it into indeed. this other on nixon level yeah and again it just uh these yes. are these are ideas that would have gotten me the thrown out of the vpers room that's that's again i keep coming back to that in a very funny way <laughs> well <laughs> It, it, it's something. It's something you and I talked about. I remember when you came on the show last time. This idea that just you would not, you you know, you came up with the gate storyline, the Trump, this New York yeah. Times story about Trump stealing money from voters. Uh, you know, we'd be, you know, you'd be laughed out of uh, uh, writing rooms. You and Julia Louis Dreyfus tried to play up the veepness of Trump at the Democratic National Convention last summer, which Julia uh, hosted. Uh, the Biden team shut you down, didn't they? According to a new book by Jonathan Allen and Amy Parnas. They didn't like that. They didn't like the direction you were going and made you soften it. Um, I, you know, again, uh, they, uh, I guess they, you know, obviously they were somewhat concerned. And again, this is, I think, something that, you know, happens with Democrats al alike a lot. And you were talking about this earlier um, with, uh, you know, you're talking about like Al Franken and stuff, where we hold ourselves to a higher standard. And this, I think their concept was if we bring, if we attack Donald Trump for his general mental unfitness, that they're somehow going to then turn around and do it to Joe Biden, but that if we don't do it, they won't. And of course, they do it no matter what. And my point at the time was, exactly. let's just do it first. Let's just do it first. What are we waiting for? Um, and obviously, you know, it seems in some ways like during the entire um, uh, Democratic convention, certainly during his, you know, every time Joe Biden speaks, there's this unfortunate sort of, I think, sometimes, like, I guess, Republican expectation of wait till he messes up. Let's watch to see how Biden messes up. And he doesn't mess up. And yet they never see what their own guy does as he, whether it's messes up, calls people the wrong name, throws toilet paper, looks at an eclipse, you know, pick pick your poison. But it's, you know, again, they just attack, attack, attack. And what I loved about Julia hosting the night of the Democratic convention was we're going to attack back. That's why you hire Julia Louis-Dreyfus to host the night of your uh, convention, to attack back a little bit. So um, that, that's, a, that was my point. It's a very good point. Yeah. La Last quick question before we run out of time. 30 seconds left. Joe Biden, uh, SNL is now on its third Biden impersonator that we've counted. Is there something about Biden that's hard to satirize? Is boring Biden good for the country, even if it's bad for comedy and satire? 
I mean, I love boring Biden. I, I do love it. And with no offense to SNL, all I can say is check out Dana Carvey's Biden impression. It's really, really, really good. It's not yes. on SNL, but it is really good. And it shows the way to what that impression should be, could be. Um, it's, it's, it's really quite good. Yeah. No, I've seen it, and I, I would second that. David Mandel, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I appreciate it. Finally, tonight, Andrew Giuliani, the son of Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani, says he plans to run for governor of New York next year. Apparently, Giuliani looked at scandal-ridden governor Andrew Cuomo and decided that what the Empire State really needs is another son named Andrew who hails from a politically connected family. Then again, Andrew Giuliani is the only one who was played by Chris Farley on SNL in the 1990s. I love that clip. Unlike his father, Andrew Giuliani has never held elected office, but he does love golf and he's a favorite golfing partner of Donald Trump, who gave Giuliani Jr. a job as special assistant to the president, where he was paid $95,000 a year to arrange White House visits by sports teams. Giuliani Jr. has very little chance of winning, but if, when he loses, he can always hire his dad to hold a rambling, lie-filled press conference and say the vote was rigged. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. And I'll see you back here tomorrow night, 7 p.m., right here on Peacock. Good night. <laughs>